All right. So we are recording this webinar now. Today is Wednesday, May 20th. We're going to be joined in just a second by Dave Jackson. Before we do that, I want to uh, remind folks who haven't been here in a while or maybe who've never been here, if you go to the file menu in the upper left-hand corner and go to either save or save as, check the document and you're able to save a PDF copy of this presentation. So I encourage you to do that. You have a choice to save it as a PDF or a UCF. You want to save it as a PDF because a UCF, even though it's listed as a universal communications format, it's anything but universal. So uh, go ahead and save it. Dave has a lot of uh, great slides in here with some some specific details that you may want to refer back to. So I, I encourage you to uh, save a copy of that PDF. Now, for those people who are watching this webinar as an archive, you don't have that option. But if you go to the Cornell Forest Connect Ning site, and I'll type that um, I'll type that address here in the chat window in just a second, then uh, you'll be able to get a get a call upload a copy of the PDF to that site, assuming it's not too big. Okay, with that, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dave Jackson. Dave is an Extension Forester, um, Regional Forestry Specialist at Penn State, and uh, Dave and I have uh, talked about uh, herbicides, forest herbicides. We've visited field sites. Dave's done some outstanding work on forest herbicides. In fact, he wrote the um, what I call the Penn State Forest Herbicide Manual. I just put a link for that in the window. This is whenever people start talking to me about forest herbicides, I say, have you read Dave's manual on it? So um, there's that link. If you haven't seen it, take a, take a look at it. It gives some great background foundational information. So with that, I'm going to uh, mute my microphone. Dave, the, I'll say the floor is yours, the airways are yours, and uh, I'm going to sit here and hover in the background and enjoy your presentation. So welcome and thank you for putting this presentation together. Okay, thanks a lot, Pete. Appreciate being on with folks today. A um, couple things, I guess, just to remind folks as we go through the presentation today, if you have questions, feel free to type those in, but we're going to try to hold presentations till the end, and then we'll try to get to those in the order that they re were received. But So you don't forget them. Feel free to type them in. If there's um, something that Pete can clarify, we can go ahead and answer that right away, but otherwise we'll try to get to everything at the end. Uh, I gave this presentation last week at our Association of Consulting Forest. There's a meeting here in Pennsylvania, and it was uh, very well received. So I think um, uh, hopefully you'll get a lot of good information out of this. So it's entitled Forestry Herbicides, a Review of Principles and Recent Research. So I'm going to go through a lot of different examples and specifics with products and concentrations and review some research that I've done and also some research that other folks in the Forest Service and, and one of my colleagues here at Penn State has done. So with that, we'll go ahead and get rolling here. So just to give you a little bit of background information here and get us on the same page as far as what we're going to try to cover today, uh, herbicide use in forestry. We use herbicides in forestry to manage vegetation to control undesirable plants. So that's what we're looking at. We're trying to give these plants a competitive advantage over desirable trees and seedlings um, to uh, give them more sunlight, more moisture, more nutrients. And we're going to try to, to put a twist on this that they are similar to agriculture in that we have to control weeds in order to gr grow the crop that we're looking for. In this case, you know, our crop is the trees, whether they're seedlings or you know mature trees but it's still similar to agriculture. The application methods are certainly different, but we can still make that an analogy. So forestry herbicides manage vegetation. So what are the different ways or, or reasons why we manage vegetation? Well, to prepare sites for planting or natural regeneration, we want to control those understory or midstory plants that are competing or interfering. We want to reduce competition around planted seedlings. Uh, we want to improve timber stands, release crop trees, control cold trees and other undesirable species out there, create and maintain wildlife habitat, 
maintenance of roads. So all of these are different uses that we have for forestry herbicides and different ways that we manage vegetation in forestry. So I'm going to give you a little disclaimer here before we get into the actual practices here. So the active ingredients described in this presentation are produced by a variety of manufacturers. Generic formulations with identical efficacy may be available. Trade names are used to give specific information. Penn State Cooperative Extension does not endorse or guarantee any product and does not recommend one product instead of another that might be similar. So regulations do vary by state. So Pete and I were talking about that, just the differences between uh, Pennsylvania and New York are, are considerable. So be sure, to check, be sure to check with your state regulatory agency before applying any pesticide and always read and follow label precautions. So with that, this is what we're going to focus on today. We're going to be focusing on manual application methods. So we're not going to look at treatments that are broadcast types of applications using skitter mounted mist blowers or anything like that. We're going to focus on backpack treatments using uh, foliar spray applications, basal bark applications, axe frill or hack and squirt treatments, and stump treatments. And so some of the reasons why we're really looking at this uh, manual application methods is that they're suited to small non-industrial ownerships and I know between our states here, between New York and Pennsylvania, you know, the bulk of our ownerships are non-industrial and, and small acreage. I think our average size of ownership in Pennsylvania is now down to uh, 16 acres. So they're not limited by rugged, steep terrain. They're very target specific. If you look at some of these application methods, we're specific to that tree or that stem that we're actually putting that product in. So they're very target specific. And that's a great selling point for the use of a lot of these things because a lot of people uh, still have some hesitancy about use of herbicides. And so when we can say these products are going into just that stem that we're treating, that's a very good selling point. They require minimal training and equipment, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. Uh, there's low risk to the user and to the environment, and I'll have a whole other presentation that we won't get into uh, any of that, but that covers those kinds of things. So low risk to the user, low risk to the environment. Um, certainly much safer uh, to use you know, herbicide applications rather than running a chainsaw all day like for some of our timber stand improvement practices uh, recommended. And control stump and root sprouts. So we can cut a lot of these things, but without herbicide applications, these things are simply going to stump sprout or, or root sucker again. So we really haven't succeeded in controlling that plant at all. So what do I need to get started with these manual herbicide types of applications? Well, the first thing I'm going to show you certainly is a, is a backpack sprayer. Um, you can do a lot of work with a backpack sprayer, but I tell you, you want to invest in the shoulder saver harness as you won't want to put it back on again without one of these things. So uh, to me, this is similar to wearing a backpack for hiking. Uh, it puts the weight on your hips. It has a nice belt that goes around your waist there. And so you can get that adjusted, and it really will save you um, by putting that on there. So adjustable comb brass spray tips. So the tip that you uh, receive with your backpack sprayer probably won't be an adjustable comb. You want to invest in a various uh, number of different sizes for this, everything from the smallest aperture, like a, a Y2, uh, up to even you know, an, an X6 or X8, so something a little bit larger that you can spray for foliar applications. Invest in a strainer with a check valve. What this is is a little uh, check valve and a screen that you insert right behind the tip at the base of your wand. And as the pressure goes down slightly in your backpack prayer, that check valve will shut off the herbicide right there at that tip so you get no drippage or, or anything from the tip of the, of the wand. And that'll save you a product. You won't be dripping it as you're walking from stem to stem that you're treating. So a little check valve and the strainer is going to go a long ways to uh, saving you herbicide. It's a very inexpensive investment. Hatch it in a spray bottle, and we'll talk some more about this 
application methods and some of the research and, and what to actually use as far as a hatchet is concerned. Uh, your measuring cup, certainly, and leak-proof storage containers. So you want to store your two and a half gallon containers in something like this in case they do leak that you don't have a spill to deal with. And then personal protective clothing. And so if you look at a lot of labels on the products that we're going to be talking about today, the bare minimum is shoes and socks, long pants, and a long sleeve shirt. I often see applicators out there, and you can even see in the image here with the shoulder saver harness is wearing short sleeves, and that technically is not uh, by label recommendations for any of the products that we're going to talk about. So long sleeve shirt, and then in addition to that, a lot of the products that we'll mention will ask you to wear uh, the rubber gloves, and one that we're going to talk about will require you to have eye protection. So I'm going to say kind of a standard is what you see in this image, long pants, you know, boots, long sleeve shirt, rubber gloves, and eye protection because when working in the woods and you're applying herbicides, a lot of times you won't see uh, you know, a small twig or something like that. So the eye protection, even if the herbicide doesn't recommend it, it's certainly something that you should have on. So the first application method, foliar spray. So here's a little bit of the background about foliar sprays. So target stems less than 10 feet tall with an adjustable cone nozzle. You can adjust that nozzle from a fine mist to a straight stream, and you can pump that backpack sprayer up. You could probably even reach uh, higher than 10 feet, but you're going to be putting out some product trying to do that. But you can adjust that that nozzle to, to that straight stream, and you can reach pretty high with that. You want to completely wet the foliage, but not to the point that it's dripping off onto the ground line. That's just wasted product, and, and you're going to get a lot of non-target damage. You want even coverage and best results from mid to late summer. So once those plants have completely leafed out, now they're photosynthesizing, they're bringing material down to the root system. So I generally say for a lot of these, particularly some of the invasive plants that we're going to mention here, uh, after the 4th of July, we want to get out and do our treatments for best results. So I'm going to go through examples like this with actual treatments that we've done, with products that we use, the concentration that we've uh, actually applied them at. So the, this is treating grass and weeds around planted trees or tube trees, so the trees are in tree protectors so that we don't get the herbicide onto the foliage. So heavy grass cover treated with a 2% solution of rodeo, which is glyphosate, plus surfactant and water. If you need added control, so you can add something like Oust XP, which is sulfur metron methyl at two ounces per acre. The Oust XP will give you a little bit of soil activity. It controls grasses and broadleaf weeds, and it also has pre-emergence activity, which means it will uh, prevent seeds from actually germinating. So on one of these sites, I had a lot of uh, grass that was an annual grass that came from seed. Add a little outs to that, it'll actually help to control that seed from germinating on those sites, give you a little bit longer control. Next one is for foliar sprays, they're treating hay scented fern. So spraying fern using a backpack sprayer and a 2% solution of rodeo, which is glyphosate plus surfactant. Again, we can add two ounces of Oust XP per acre for grass and sedge control. So remember the, the Oust XP is a grass and broadleaf weed herbicide. And it's going to give you added control. If you have grass or sedge, particularly grass, it's going to come from seed that's going to germinate on that site after you remove that fern. Uh, you can see on the image there on the left there where the fern was treated. That's just a carpet of black cherry seedlings that germinated uh, within uh, this is actually the beginning of the second growing season. So essentially what you see there is just what came in in one growing season by removing that fern competition. So how about invasive shrubs? Looking at things like multiflora rose, autumn olive, shrub honeysuckle, privet, and Japanese barberry. So this is work that was done by a colleague of mine here at Penn State by the name of Art Gover. So spraying multiflora rose here using a two-to-one mixture of 5% rodeo glyphosate, 
and a 2.5% mixture of Garlon 3A. So these are combined with a surfactant in water. This is a broad spectrum mix. It's non-selective. It's a mix that actually uh, is aquatic safe. So both of those products have aquatic labels. But by mixing those two together in your backpack sprayer, it's going to give you a broader spectrum of control. You're going to be able to take things like autumn olive out, which are susceptible more so to triclopyr, uh, and shrub honeysuckle, which is susceptible more to glyphosate. Often you find these plants growing on the same sites, and by putting the two together now, you're going to be able to take both of those out. Again, applying these from mid to late summer is going to give you the best results. So how about Japanese stiltgrass? This is one that we are dealing with quite heavily through central Pennsylvania and, and southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, Japanese stiltgrass is spread across much of the United States already. Um, if you're not dealing with it yet, I hope you don't get it, but there's a good chance that you will. But we're going to look at pre-emergent treatments of stiltgrass with three ounces of XP. Again, that's sulfometron methyl in mid-April. So by putting these down as a pre-emergence, it gives us an advantage of being able to apply these over top of seedlings that are dormant. So a very selective kind of treatment where we can put it over top of oak seedlings, whatever we have out there, as long as they haven't broken dormancy, it's going to affect seed germination because still grass is an annual grass that has to come back each year uh, from seed. So you can spray those patches of brown dead grass from the previous growing season and get that herbicide down into the soil after it rains. Once it's emerged, you have a couple different options here. Selective treatments um, using just a grass herbicide like a Sure 2. We actually sprayed uh, 15 acres of this on a timber sale on our demonstration woodlot this year at the rate of four ounces per acre. So the grass had already emerged. Uh, we weren't looking to control seed, but we were looking for something that was selective to grass that wouldn't harm our existing seedlings. So we use a grass herbicide. Now we can non-selectively take out Japanese still grass as well. We won't affect seed that's stored in the soil, but we can also treat it with just a, a 1 or 2 percent solution of rhodia, which is glyphosate plus surfactant as well. So a couple a uh, number of different options there for treating stillgrass, some very selective and some not selective at all. So next we're going to talk about basal bark applications. So thin bark trees, generally less than 6 inches in diameter. We're going to wet the lower 12 to 18 inches of the trunk completely around the tree. We can apply these at any time of the year. We're going to use an ultra low volume basal wand. It's a B&G Extend the band wand is what, what I use and what's recommended with a drip proof valve. So it actually has a cable that runs down to the tip and actually shuts that tip off uh, right at the end there. So this one you don't need to insert that check valve in it when you invest in this wand. The carrier is a basil oil, so you want to purchase the commercially available basil oils. And these are practices, basil bark practices, are, our treatments are good for low numbers of stems per acre, so less than you know, 500, even less than 400 stems per acre uh, make these a little more financially feasible. So beech and striped maple control, common types of applications for basil bark, treating saplings and sprouts with a 10% mixture of Garlon 4. Garlon 4 is the ester formulation of triclopyr. It's mixed in oil. This treatment was done in early spring before bud break. So the neat thing about triclopyr is not translocated to untreated stems. So I want to give you a couple of quotes here from Kokendorfer, who was a, a researcher with the U.S. Forest Service. He says, unlike glyphosate, triclopyr, which is Garlon 4 that I used, uh, is not as mobile within treated plants. So basal spray applications and beech stems did not result in control of larger untreated stems. He says, basal spray treatments are not effective um, are not are only effective on treated stems. Triclopyr, garland 4, is not translocated to untreated stems. So you can treat all the suckers underneath a parent beech tree 
without actually controlling the untreated parent tree. So some of you may find that desirable where you want to remove the suckers, but you want to leave the parent tree there. Maybe it's still a healthy tree. Uh, maybe it's producing beech nuts for you, but you don't want to kill the parent tree. You can use Trichopyr and Garlon 4 and actually remove those suckers and let sunlight into the forest floor there without taking the parent tree out. Another good basil bark application, treating grapevines. So you can treat the stem of the, of the grapevine, 25% mixture of garland 4 in oil applied as a low volume treatment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, what that means here in a minute. But that's an effective treatment at controlling grapevines. So in areas where you have a grapevine problem there, it's particularly where they're going to be harvested and you're going to let that light in there. Go through that stand first, treat the grapevines, take those out, and then open them up. Otherwise, you're going to have some major grapevine problems on your regen. So here's a basal bark rate study. This was a study that I put in. Uh, when I first started working here, everybody was recommending a 25% uh, solution for basal bark applications. Uh, if you look at the Garlon 4 label, it actually indicates two types of basal bark treatments. And so the only difference in these two types of treatments I highlight here in red. So the basal bark treatment would say use a 1 to 5% mixture and spray until runoff at the ground line was notice noticeable. The low volume basal bark treatment, so low volume, we're using a very concentrated mixture, but we're putting it out at very low volumes. It says to use a 20 to 30% mixture but do not spray it to the point of runoff. And if you've ever done basal bark applications where you have to treat completely around the stem from the ground line up to, say, 15 inches or so, uh, it's pretty difficult to apply that without some runoff at the ground line. So it got me thinking, maybe we can make the same exact application using a much lower concentration. And that's always what we want to do at forestry. If we can receive, achieve the same results using lower concentrations, that's what we want to do. So I looked at the effectiveness of Garlon 4, which is 61.6% triclopyrapide as a basal spray at controlling five different tree species, American beech stripe maple, red maple, eastern hop hornbeam, and black birch. I looked at three different concentrations, a 1%, 2.5%, and a 5%, and I applied them at two different times of year, early spring, which we'll call the dormant season, and then summer growing season treatment. So here's the actual setup. This was the birch plot. You can see the different colors represented the three different concentrations, and then the different bands on the trees. One or two bands was a spring or summer treatment. There I'm treating the black birch and the hop hornbeam. This is what the 5% summer beach plot looked like. So you can see the amount of sunlight that we brought into the forest floor through the treatment of these uh, root suckers. And then what I'll show you here is that we were able to achieve 85% or greater control for all five species using just 5% Garlon 4 solution in both spring and summer. The exception was, and you see it highlighted there in yellow, was the hop hornbeam, where we were only able to achieve 64% on the summer treatment. Okay, so but you can look at the American beach treatment, 5% in both spring and summer, 99%, 100%. Uh, look at black birch there, 97 percent, 100 percent, and striped maple. You know they were all very successful treatments using just a 5 percent concentration and applying them in exactly the same way, same equipment, same material as the uh, the low volume application recommends. So here's a quote from Kokendorfer in 2012. So basal spraying is especially adaptive for treating relatively low numbers of small thin bark species like beech and striped maple because they require less spray and lower concentrations of spray. Um, so he says 10% Garland 4 and my work actually showed that you can go down to probably as low as 5% on these species. So much lower than what those low volume rates of 20 to 30% are recommending. So other work is documented, this is by Nyland, documented that basal bark treatments are most effective 
when there are fewer than 400 to 500 stems per acre and stem diameter is less than six inches. If more than 500 stems per acre, a broadcast foliar treatment offers the best control, but note that those broadcast treatments are going to impact all ground level species, so they're not selective, they're not specific to the stems you're treating because now you're broadcasting that herbicide. So let's move into Axe Frill, and I'm going to call these hack and squirt treatments. So we're going to use a hatchet and a squirt bottle to put the herbicide into those cuts. We're going to use that to control individual trees, generally over one, inches, uh, one inch in diameter. The cuts must penetrate through the bark, so we need to get <clears throat> into that cambium layer and into the sapwood. So the cambium is a layer right where the bark meets the wood. And the sapwood is that first layer of wood that you're going to get into underneath the bark. We're going to put in one incision per inch of diameter, so 10 inch trees. We're going to get 10 hacks. Do not apply during periods of sap flow. So I'll show you some work. So if you have sap flow, it's going to push the herbicide out of those cuts. And it's not going to go into the tree. So I'm going to recommend that you use something like this, a hatchet with a ground down bit. This bit is 1.75 inches. So at 1.75 inches, we're treating just over half the circumference of the tree when we have one hack per inch of diameter. The other thing the ground down bit does for us, it allows the frill that actually downward angle cut to be more of a have more of a cupping effect to actually hold the herbicide in there. So if you were to use something with a very long blade, let's say, for example, a machete, the edges of that cut would be open on the ends, and it would allow, allow that herbicide to run out. So any herbicide that's running out of that cut is herbicide that's wasted. So we're going to use something that has a narrower blade, and we're going to make that downward cut, and we're simply going to fill those cuts up with the herbicide solution by spraying it in there. Once it's full, you see it running out, go to the next cut. So here's an example on black gum. So hack and squirting a black gum using a hatchet and gun jet herbicide gun attached to a backpack sprayer containing a 50% solution of glyphosate 41, which is glyphosate. This is U.S. Forest Service work. So if you had a lot of trees to treat or you're going to be away from your truck, putting a gallon of your herbicide solution in a backpack sprayer, switching out your wand to this Gunjet herbicide gun uh, is going to allow you to not have to run back and refill every time that your quart bottle fill, uh, runs out. So you can carry a gallon or more, but a gallon is going to get you an awful long way. So an easy way to carry product without having to run back to the truck that you can use for hack and squirt treatments. So hack and squirt treatments of striped maple. This was work that was done by Kokendorfer of the U.S. Forest Service. So what's the effectiveness? He looked at two different active ingredients, glyphosate and amazapir. So glyphosate was in Glypro Plus. Amazapir was in a product called Arsenal. They applied them by hack and squirt. Uh, average tree diameters were 1.8 inches. Again, they used one incision per inch. They looked at four different concentrations, um, two with the Glypro and two with the Arsenal. And then they looked at two different times of year. So we know that striped maple and maples in general are difficult to control with glyphosate. So let's look at their results. So the first, let me mention what the colors are first. So the blue are the June treatments and the red are the September treatments. And I'll grab my arrow here. So you can look here. This column here was the amazapir at 6%. This is the amazapir of the arsenal at 9%. And then there's our glyphosate treatments over here. So you can see very clearly that glyphosate is not a real strong herbicide on the striped maple. What they saw was that it controlled the top of the tree, but they ultimately got re-sprouting. And so <clears throat> I'll show you what that looked like here in the next slide. So here's hack and squirt on striped maple. So they, again, they killed the top of the striped maple, 
This was using a 50% solution of Razor Pro, which is glyphosate, and they got resprouting. So basically, the moral of this research is that if you're gonna, if you're gonna um, going to be treating maple, whether it's red maple or striped maple, your herbicide of choice is going to be a mazapir. In this case, in this study, they used a mazapir in Arsenal was the name of the product. So here's some work that I did with Gover here at, at Penn State, uh, hack and squirt control of Tree of Heaven. So we looked at the effectiveness of a poured concentrate, which is another glyphosate product applied by hack and squirt. And we looked at two different kinds of treatments using complete frill girdles versus spaced cuts, so leaving spaces between our cuts. We used a 50% solution of a cord concentrate, and we applied our treatment in early October. So let me show you the results. So this was the result of the complete frill girdle plot. So we completely girdled every single stem, including the small stem. So if there were a uh, really small tree of heaven there, even the size of my finger, we would break the top off and actually treat the cut surface. So in every single stem, the top was completely removed from the bottom by girdling or either breaking it off. And you can see really clearly, if I grab my pointer here, all this stuff that you see down here is what re-sprouted in just one growing season. We put the treatment in in October 2007. This image was taken July 2008. This stuff had re-sprouted vigorously. So with the complete frill, we found that you remove the phloem vessels, and the phloem is what uh, um, brings the sugars that are manufactured in the leaves down into the root system. And so it's found direct, directly underneath the bark. And we actually cut all that foam by doing complete frill girdles and didn't allow any of that herbicide to translocate to the root system. So that basically we did not control the roots. So let's look at the space cuts plot. And you can see in this case, there was absolutely no re-sprouting whatsoever. So in both treatments, we killed the top of the tree, but only when we left spaces between our cuts where we left that phloem intact and we got translocation to the roots, did we actually get control of the root system on the tree of heaven. I think we had one or two little small sprigs, and they may have even come up from seed. I'm not even sure they were attached to an existing root system. But space cuts were the key here to getting the herbicide to the roots and controlling the tree of heaven with just a 50% solution of, uh, of glyphosate. So space cuts, one per inch of diameter, and I'm going to say don't use complete frill girdles because you're basically uh, removing the mechanism that would allow for translocation of the herbicide to the root systems with a complete frill. So another study that I looked at was uh, beech hack and squirt control. So can we hack and squirt a tree, control that tree, but also control the root suckers attached to that tree's root system? So we looked at rodeo, which is glyphosate, and polaris, which is a mazapir, applied as a hack and squirt. Can we control root suckers? We had two size classes that were treated, so all beets greater than four inches and all beets greater than 10 inches. So on each of our plots, uh, we either had a four-inch plot or a 10-inch plot where all trees over 10 inches or all trees over four inches were treated. We applied the herbicide at one incision per inch of diameter. So you see the numbers on the trees there. That actually was the number of hacks we had to put in the tree. And the two concentrations were 50% rodeo and 5% Polaris. So much lower concentration of a Mazapir, uh, as the label recommends, for those kinds of treatments. We applied it at the optimum time of year, mid-September, when we knew we were getting translocation uh, down to the root system. So we thought we would get our best results at that time of year. So how about controlling the overstory trees? Well, I'll show you that both products 
were very successful at controlling the overstory. You can see here with the uh, with the glyphosate treatments here, the Rodeo 4-inch, 100%, the Rodeo 10-inch, 100%, the Polaris on the 4-inch plots, 93%, and 10-inch plots had dropped to 83%. So in that case, you can see the... Um, the Rodeo, the glyphosate, was a little bit better than the Polaris or the Amazapir at controlling the overstory trees. You can see this treatment was very inexpensive. If you look across that last column, range, we timed each application from $15 even down as low as $6 per acre. Uh, that's based on $10 per hour labor costs, and you see the herbicide costs there. So even so the Polaris AC is $140 a gallon. You're only putting it out as a 6% concentration. So we treated 95 beech stems at a cost of only $15.40 per acre for that rodeo 4-inch plot. And on the Polaris 10-inch plot, we treated 30 beech trees per acre and uh, the cost was only $6.38 per acre based on how long it took us to treat those trees. So how about the understory? Did we actually achieve our results? Did we get control of the understory? So here's a table that I'll show you quickly. If you look at the, uh, the rodeo four-inch plot, on the small saplings less than uh, or greater than one foot but but up to three foot tall, 61 percent, a little bit larger stems, three foot to six foot, 59 percent, and it drops off here, 42 percent, and then down to zero. So with the Amazapir, on the smallest step, we got 66 percent control, then it drops off to 41, then 34, and then 12. We didn't do nearly as well if we treated only the 10-inch trees, as you might imagine, because there were a lot of other stems in that stand that we didn't treat that weren't attached to treated trees. So they, they didn't have suckers that were attached to a treated tree. So to d explain this just a bit further, on this plot we had 1,325 stems per acre in that size category, and we were able to get control of 61% of those. Same thing here, 1,450 stems in this size class, and we were able to get 59% control of those just by hack and squirting all the beach on that plot four inches and greater. So looking down here, I'll show you uh, what we were able to achieve here in numbers. So we treated 95 stems here, and we actually were able to control more than 2,000 treated 67 and a half stems here, and we're able to control again more than 2,000 stems per acre. So this might be a viable alternative at that cost to still get pretty good control of a sufficient number of the suckers down there. So treating only the uh, commercial viable trees, so you can treat these trees pre-harvest. Uh, if you plan this accordingly, you could harvest these trees and still get a pretty significant number of the understory sprouts and root suckers actually controlled. Kokendorfer has a different suggestion, and, and in a sense, I think this needs to be modified based on your stand condition, but injection of all beech stems one inch in diameter and larger with a 50% solution of glyphosate would distribute enough herbicide to give adequate control of most existing beech root sprouts. And what I'm going to say is that you need to modify this based on the stand conditions because if the parent trees have been harvested or if they've already died from beech bark disease, then yes, you probably do need to go down to one inches in diameter. But if the parent trees are there, what I'm going to say is that you need to treat the overstory trees. So whatever their size of those overstory trees are, if they have their canopy up there, you probably need to be treating them because those are probably going to have root suckers attached to them. And, I, and I'll back this up a second. So the reason that, and I can explain this, why we only were able to get you know in the 60s as far as our percent control on the sprouts is because a lot of that herbicide we were putting into those parent trees 
was not translocated. A lot of it went to that parent tree and it was used to control the parent tree. And we got very good control on the parent trees. And I think majority of the herbicide was utilized there versus being translocated to those root suckers. So we'll show you a different method here down the road uh, that, that gave actually better control. So black birch hack and squirt. This was a study that I put at the request of uh, one of our applicators down here who was having difficulty controlling black birch. So I looked at three different products here, uh, glyphosate, triclopyr, and amazapyr, three different active ingredients applied by hack and squirt at controlling black birch. I, I hack and squirted trees that were from two to 14 inches in diameter. Uh, looked at three different solutions. 50% Accord, which is glyphosate, 50% Garland 3A, which is triclopyr, and a 5% uh, Polaris AC, which is Amazapyr. I did this all year round, so there were six different treatments starting in February and ending in December. So every other month, I made a treatment. This is the BERT site, and this is the results. So you can see very clearly that there were two months out of the year, April here and October here, that we did not achieve control. The blue lines that you see here are the glyphosate applications. The red is the triclopyr, and the green is the amazapyr treatment. So glyphosate was 100% effective in these months. In these months of April and October, you can see our effectiveness virtually dropped right off to zero. So what was the difference? It was sap flow. So when, when I hacked the trees in April and when I hacked the trees in, in October, we had significant sap flow in April. It was like turning on a faucet almost where all the herbicide just got pushed right out of the frills. Nothing went in, into the tree, no control of, of those trees. And because we were using space cuts, uh, we didn't get any control of them whatsoever. So the moral of this story is that if you're going to hack and squirt trees, you can't do it if they're sapful. You're just not going to get that herbicide into those stems. So make sure that if you're going to hack and squirt, you can do it year-round. But if there's sap flow, um, you better go do something else that day. So black birch, we found that a 50% solution of rodeo or glyphosate was used to treat this um, was very effective at treating black birch. So to kind of sum some of the hack and squirt points up here, so it's the least expensive manual herbicide application method. We saw you know, values from you know in the teens even down into you know less than ten dollars per acre. It's a very target specific treatment where the herbicide is going directly into those stems you're treating and it's used on all stems greater, or can be used on all stems greater than one inch in diameter, and, and even smaller, to be honest with you, because you can just simply either chop through those trees and treat the cut surface, or you can just break them over and, and treat that surface as well. Used on, used on steep topography, small ownerships, uh, used without impacting advanced regeneration, so again, target-specific. And treatments containing a mazapir, so the Arsenal AC or the Polaris AC uh, or glyphosate, such as Rhodia, will control a large proportion of attached root sprouts on American beach. We saw better than 65% control on some of the size classes. And then treatments containing a mazapir will control sprouting on maple. So if you have maple, you've got to be looking at a mazapir. So the disadvantage. Uh, use is restricted to times of year with no sap flow and more specifically to the late growing season for root suckering species like Tree of Heaven or American Beech. So the last one we're going to cover today are stump treatments. So we're going to try to control the sprouts on cut hardwood stumps so we don't want these to re-sprout. It's a less desirable species. We don't want the competition there. We want to make sure if it's cut that it doesn't re-sprout. So we're going to treat the cambio layer and the sapwood, the outer two inches of the stump service. If we're using a water-soluble herbicide, we're going to treat it immediately after cutting on that fresh service. If we're using 
an oil-soluble herbicide, we're going to treat up to one month later. But when we do that, we're going to treat the side of the stump as well as that cambial layer. And we're not going to apply during times of heavy sap flow, just like with the hack and squirt. If you see water coming up out of those stumps, you're not going to get herbicide down to control that root system. So for large stumps, we're going to just spray that outer sapwood layer, that outer two inches. For small stumps, we're going to treat that complete surface. This is a two-step process that so greatly increases our cost. We have to cut it and then go back and treat it. Uh, this is an applicator in Pennsylvania who had adapted kind of an integrated approach here. And you can see that he has actually got a backpack sprayer on here along with a weed eater. And the weed eater, he had the blade on the bottom here with the saw blade. And he was able to go through this stand and actually cut and treat at the same time. time he had rigged it up so the wand from his backpack sprayer uh, was held right there on the uh, weed eater, so when he cut it, he could just move forward and actually spray the stump uh, immediately afterwards and move through. This was a stand that he had a contract for of treating all the striped maple in the understory. So this is work from Art Gover on stump treating tree of heaven. So basically the recommendation is stump treat with a 25% solution of Garlon 4, so that's a low volume application in oil and he says that you should only cut Atlantis if you are planning on treating the resulting re-sprouts. In situations where you want to remove Atlantis stems, it's better to cut after you have treated and actually controlled that tree. So if you have to cut it down, kill it first and then come back and cut it because this is exactly the same kind of thing as doing a complete frill girdle. You've removed the top of the tree, you've removed that mechanism that would bring the herbicide and translocate it through the root systems. And so you will not get control. If you cut every single lanthus that's in this patch or whatever you're treating, there's no mechanism to actually move that herbicide throughout those root systems and you'll get re-sprouting. So we're going to wrap things up with a couple of different beet studies. So here's the first one, effectiveness of Glypro, which is glyphosate applied by stump treatment at controlling beet stump and root sprouts. So they treated all trees greater than six inches in diameter within one hour of cutting. They used a 100% uh, Glypro concentration, so right out of the jug, 100%. And they treated this, again, the optimum time of year, early September. This was work that was done by Kokendorf for the U.S. Forest Service. So here's his results. So beech stump treatment of the three different size classes, so all the stems less than six inches in diameter that were treated, you can see he got in the 90s on, on every single one of these. Now, all of these were treated with 100% glyphosate. So 100% glypro right out of the jug, um, so 90% to 96%, 98%. And then you can see also the cost of this, so considerably more cost involved. And now also keep in mind, this cost does not include the cost of cutting, uh, $62 to $39 per acre. Uh, and you can see the number of stems was very similar to what I treated on the hack and squirt treatment. So cost significantly more, and even including the cost of, of cutting would, would really increase this cost. But great control. So why did they get so much more control on the suckers when they treated stumps of only the trees that were six inches and larger? Well, keep in mind now, this is a little bit different because they've removed that one parent tree now. So the herbicide now is going into that stump. It doesn't have to translocate throughout the parent tree like in the hack and squirt study. The other thing that's still intact is that all those suckers that are attached to that stump's root system are also intact. So it's very different than the Tree of Heaven study where we treated every single stem. So we still have a way for the herbicide to move down through that stump and over into these existing suckers because those suckers 
are still transpiring. So they're still moving water out through the leaves. And they're going to take that herbicide that's put on that stump and actually move it right through that system. And so in this case, you get a lot better control on the beech stems by just treating that uh, few parent trees that were six inches and greater. So the last one was, do we really need to treat these things, these stumps, immediately after they're harvested? And this was work, again, done by Kokendorf for the U.S. Forest Service. So the question was, if I'm checking on a logging job and he's cutting these trees, and but he's not a certified applicator, and I am, can I come back uh, every couple of days and just walk through that stand and treat those stumps and still get good control of the sprout so that I don't get re-sprouting and I don't have problems with sprouts interfering with regeneration. So he treated all beech 11 to 15 inches in diameter using a Razor Pro solution of glyphosate on September 10th. And he had a number of different time intervals that he looked at, everything from one hour right on up to five days after uh, they were cut. And you can see he got uh, great control on the root sprouts all the way out to 96 hours after the treatment, which was four days after it was cut. They were still able to receive or achieve uh, anywhere from 71 to 86 percent control on the sprouts. The 120-hour treatment, which was five days after it was cut, he only got 50 percent control on the sprouts. And you can see on the stump sprout control, they got somewhere between 100% on out to four days and the 120-hour treatments, it was 75%. Now, the caveat to this was that he indicates that part of the reason that he was able to go out to four days was that the weather uh, was very conducive for the stump not to dry out. It wasn't hot, dry weather. Uh, this was a high elevation site in the Appalachians in West Virginia, and uh, they had some cool weather and some misty kind of foggy weather as well. So the stump surface, he feels like, would never dry it out. So even four days out, he was still able to get good translocation of the herbicide down through that stump and out to the existing suckers that were attached to that root system. So here's a, a quote I share with you from, from Pete Smolager. Uh, the most cost-effective and efficient way to control beach is when the management area has trees greater than six inches diameter at breast height that can be extracted for fuel wood. So we can make this a commercial cut. Uh, so glyphosate is applied to the cut stumps at a 25% active ingredient. So most of your glyphosate products are somewhere between 41% and 54%. So look at the percentage of active ingredient. Mix it so that you have 25% active ingredient in your solution. Treat the outer two inches of the cut surface and control of up to 85% or greater uh, is probably possible based on some of Kokendorfer's uh, work to, on the root sprouts. So you can get good control of the root sprouts um, through that, that stump treatment of beech. So to wrap things up, choosing the right forestry herbicide and application method. So we want to look at using general use products. So everything that we've shown you today are general use products. They're not restricted use, although some states do restrict their use. So you need to be sure to check your state guidelines, whether it's a, a restricted use product or not. So if it's restricted use by your state, you have to be a certified applicator in order to purchase and apply that product. Uh, they have to be labeled for your site. So there's a lot of different glyphosates, for example. Not all of them have a forest label. So you need to make sure that you're purchasing and applying a glyphosate or any product that has a forest label if that's where you're using it. Selectivity. So a lot of these products that we've shown you can be very selective and selective in the application method. And in the case of OUS, for example, uh, we can have very selective application methods where we can put it right over the top of seedlings and not actually harm them as long as they're dormant. The activity, so we look at uh, how it's active. Is it soil active? So uh, a 
herbicide that contains a mazapir, you have to be very, very careful with it because it has soil activity. It'll be picked up very readily by root systems and can kill non-target plants very quickly. Um, so what's the activity? Does it have pre-emergence activity? Does, so does it affect seed germination like ouse does? So we need to know the activity of the product. Uh, what's the number of stems per acre? You know, so we said for basal stem applications, we want fewer than you know, four or 500 stems per acre, small stems, to even make that feasible. What's the size of the plants? You know, can we reach it with a backpack sprayer? Do we have to have uh, you know, a big machine, a mist blower, come in and treat it? Are there non-target plants there? So uh, a lot of these lend themselves to uh, you know, leaving those non-targets, those desirable plants out there. What's the number of acres that we have to treat? Is it feasible to even do one of these, use one of these manual herbicide application methods, or is it too many acres to even think about covering? And then we have to understand the plant characteristics, particularly is it a plant that can root sucker? So, you know, so how does this plant regenerate? Those kinds of things we have to know. Is it an annual plant that comes back from seed? So we have to understand the plant as well. So my herbicide treatment, Guidelines are use the most effective herbicide for controlling that target species. And we learned a lot about maple today, just as an example, and its uh, susceptibility to a mazapir. Use a herbicide at the lowest rate that will provide optimum control. So we saw with the basal stem rate study that we can go down to 5%. We don't have to use these things at 25 or 30% concentration. Apply the herbicide at the optimum time of the year. So we, we saw with that one looking at things like uh, beach, you know, September. We want to get as much translocation to those root suckers as possible. Uh, follow prescribed application methods on the label. Follow all label precautions. And lastly, be patient and be persistent. So. Many of these applications are going to require follow-up, but be patient because I've seen some of these things take an entire growing season to work, and maybe you thought it wasn't even going to work, and you came back next year and it did. So I've seen that as well with some of the basal stem applications that I've done on maple. I thought, no way did this even work, and it come back the next year, and none of them even leafed out. So be patient with your applications. So. I'll, I'll leave these in the PowerPoint, so if you did download the PDF, you have all the web resources. So a lot of these were things that I referenced some of these studies from. And with that, Pete, I will open it up to questions here. And I know we're short on time, but I'm willing to, to stay on and answer folks' questions as long as we need to. All right, Dave, great. Thank you. This was, um, as I anticipated, a, an awesome webinar, and I appreciate all the time you put into it. So this is, um, Dave and I spend a lot of time about talking about herbicides, and so it was, it's a lot of fun to have Dave um, prepare this, and, and it's uh, quite useful. And there have been several questions that have come in. I'm sure that there are some others, and so I'll, I'll give I want people to get a chance to, to ask those. Um, I, I'll use my uh, host prerogative to, uh, to ask to, to lead off with a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned the shoulder saver harness. I was just actually using my backpack sprayer not too long ago. Where, where do you get those shoulder saver harnesses? I, I need one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that I, forestry suppliers or through? I have um, purchased mine through forestry suppliers. I'm sure there's probably you know, other, Ben Meadows and some other place like right. Gemplers or something like those too, but I did purchase mine through forestry suppliers. Okay, all right, good. And then you mentioned the Mazapir. Does one of the... Does a mazapir have soil activity? I know glyphosate does not have soil activity. So when it gets into the soil, it pretty much locks up on uh, organic matter. What 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 happens? Do you recall what happens to a mazapir? Yeah, a mazapir, as I mentioned there, you have to be very careful with a mazapir, and that's why these target-specific treatments uh, like hack and squirt are very uh, work very well with a mazapir is because you're not getting any of that onto the soil. If you were to broadcast an understory with a mazapir, uh, that's a very good a likelihood. Because it, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster because it has soil activity and it's going to be taken up by root systems very readily. I know people that have sprayed um, some on their driveway just to control weeds in a gravel driveway and have killed trees in their front yard that were 50 feet away because the root systems were under the driveway. So you have to be very careful with the mazapir. 
Okay. All right. So I'm going to, um, there have been lots of questions, so I'm scrolling back. I'll read the questions and Dave can respond to those. So there was, so there was a question that came in that I responded to in the chat box. It was about a backpack mist blower and whether that's considered a manual form of foliar um, application, which I said it was, but it was what differentiated was tend to be more broadcast than selective. So, all right, so here's a question. Uh, Melanie wants to know how long do the pre-emergent herbicides last? If it's uh, once, uh, once, once a year is enough or you do it every other year, just kind of can you talk about the frequency of the pre-emergent herbicides? Oust, yeah. I think you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, so we that. mentioned Oust, Oust XP exactly had pre-emergence activity. And so Oust has a very short half-life. I think it's only around 28 days actually where it begins to degrade. So after five half-lives, it's, it's virtually gone in the soil. So when I've treated sites, I've seen the first year it will control uh, pretty much everything that's there, so it's non-selective. So if you want, if you're a person that wants to leave broad leaves, and you know you're a wildflower lover, and even want goldenrod things like that, that will not be there. But what I saw was after uh, in the second growing season, you couldn't honestly even tell that was treated with an herbicide. So I treated stiltgrass on on a log landing, for example. By the end of the second growing season, you would never know there was ever a herbicide even applied, except that the stiltgrass was under control. Now, also keep in mind that stiltgrass has seed that stores in the soil, so oftentimes one application isn't going to get it. And if you did treat it with glyphosate, you know, that non-selective kind of treatment, you're not getting any kind of seed control at all. And so there's a good chance that even by the end of that growing season, new seed's going to germinate and it could go to seed again. And so Every time it goes to seed, you're setting yourself back again, uh, back to day one, basically, because now you've got to capture all that seed that stores in the soil. And it can store for as long as five years, they say. Okay. Uh, Rick Dyer wants to know about uh, different types of basal oil products. Is there Are there different kinds of oils, and, and is there a recommendation that you have for a particular basal oil? Yeah, so you'll see on the label, folks, that it will say that you can use things like diesel fuel, kerosene, heating oil, um, but I don't recommend using any of those things. I, I don't think they're uh, made to go out in our environment. And so what I'm going to tell you is to go through one of these herbicide dealers. Most even manufacture their own labeled brand, like you can go to Arbor Chem, for example, and they make an Arbor Chem brand basil oil. And so purchase what's commercially available through our herbicide dealers and distributors. And so look for those that are commercially available. They'll send them to you in a two and a half gallon jug, and that's what we want to put out. There, there are you know, different kinds of oils that are much safer and friendlier on our environment than putting out diesel fuel, for example. Okay, and I just, you mentioned Arbor Chem, and, and there are several, and Dave gave the disclaimer earlier, there are several companies that manufacture these products. I think somewhere, and maybe Dave, you in, in the manual, the forestry herbicides manual that you wrote, you have a list of, of uh, manufacturers and vendors. I somewhere have that as well, and I'll, if I can find that, I'll post it to our Ning site, which is the uh, Cornell Forest Connect .ning com, and I put that URL on the website, and I'll upload my list of vendors to that site in a blog that, that talks about today's webinar. So if people want to see where they can go get some of these products. So, all right. Um, how, do I all right. how do I change this to everyone, Pete? I actually have the website. It is on my... Um, no. So if you so if you do a you can send to all participants if you want to paste it. Okay, and I see it. Yeah. So and yeah. I I pasted the link to your manual early on in the chat box. So well, it's on my it. website. So if you go to okay. the forest vegetation management website, there's a link under the chemical okay. control with all those dealers and distributors in it. Okay. Uh, okay, so Robert Bryan has a question he wants to know about. Most guidelines I've seen recommend the Roundup version of glyphosate or its generic equivalent rather than Rodeo. 
um, for the water friendly type. He wants to know if there's a difference between in non-aquatic solutions, so in upland forest, why we talk about rodeo versus things like Roundup. Yeah, good question. Well, actually, Roundup was kind of the original. So when Roundup went off patent, everybody started making a glyphosate product. And then actually for a while there, Roundup did not have a forest label. And now Roundup does have a forest label. So you need to be looking at that more than anything. There's so many generics out there. But the the actual you know, Dow product that we're going to use that uh, as the forest label is rodeo, and rodeo is a, a, does not have surfactant in it, so you have to add a surfactant, but it also has aquatic labeling. Okay, so it's it's an environmentally friendly form of glyphosate that's labeled for um, for use in the forest, and so that's why we talk about rodeo now. Um, there's another product called the Accord XRT2, which actually it's the other Dow product that, you know, it's a non-generic, but it actually has surfactant loaded into it as, as well. So that one's even easier for us to use. We don't have to even add a surfactant to that. Um, I have not used Rodeo for any of my applications, although you will see it on my website now because they do have a forest labeled um, product now. And everybody knows the name Roundup, so it's easy to talk about it as Roundup, but there's so many other glyphosates out there. It's kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, uh, Steve Cutney is asking about Element, the, the product Element 4 versus Garlon 4 as a basal bark treatment. Are you familiar with Element 4? Yeah, it's exactly the same stuff. I'm not sure why they even have it, to be honest with you, because it's also a Dow product, just like Garlon 4 is. Uh, now they they went to Garlon 4 Ultra, it's actually called, but Element 4 is exactly the same stuff as what thought, Garlon thought, 4 was. I thought Garlon 4 was a BASF product. No, is Garlon Dow? 4 is Dow, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I'm not sure why they make it. I, I'm not sure if this is something slightly different on the site that it might be labeled for, but they both have forest labels. Okay. Uh, and then Dan Little offers a, a, a point here that's, I think, worth noting that the basal barks can be done year-round, um, but the stems must be exposed to ground level, so you can't have the root, you can't have snow snowpack around the root collar because you need to be able to treat the root collar. Yeah, Good. that's the beauty of that treatment, that it does give you that opportunity to treat year-round. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some parts of Pennsylvania, you may not have snow cover. In you know, parts of northern New York, you know, we had snow until the end of April in some areas. Yeah. So just have to be sensitive to Also, cold weather, depending upon the oil that you're using, this, the oils make uh, lose viscosity in cold temperatures and, and become harder to apply. Yeah, great point. Um, all right, so Melanie is asking about, and I think this question came in when you were talking about a complete frill versus spaced cuts, wanting to know if that concept, that principle would would have um, application for black locust and Norway maple, uh, as well as for, yes, there it is, so the complete frill versus spaced cuts. So uh, in order to get to get kill on the root system for black locust and Norway maple, you're recommending, you'd, you would also recommend spaced frill cuts. Yes, I think that in my mind, spaced cuts for everything is what I would recommend because you, that way you're not removing that mechanism. Those those foam vessels are still intact between your frills that are going to move it to the root systems. And, you, and with one hack per inch of diameter, you're still getting enough product into that tree to control it without a complete frill. And black locust root suckers, so that one would be really important. It would be no different than treating tree of heaven or, or beech. You want to get that to the root system. Uh, Terry was making reference to, you probably saw some of the World Health Organizations came out with some reports and some studies that they had done um, where they're uh, suggesting that glyphosate has car 
is may may function as a carcinogen. Do you want to talk about those at all, or how? Have, did you, first of all, did you see those, and, and how how would you react to those reports? I I heard of those that came out recently. I have not actually seen them or read them, so I'll, I'll clarify with that. Um, I have a couple different references that I quote folks. Uh, one was uh, Wildlife Society Bulletin uh, that was published a number of years ago that focused completely on herbicides and effects on wildlife. And I quote a number of different researchers in there that uh, state that you know, to date, they had not been found to be carcinogenic, any forestry labeled herbicide for that matter. And I also quote McNabb from uh, Alabama Cooperative Extension System in my publication uh, stated the same finding essentially. So I think we need to look at a couple things. Number one, how their research was done. And I'll give you an example where one of the researchers stated that glyphosate, you know, impacts you know, tadpoles, so you put a bunch of tadpoles in the bathtub and pour glyphosate in there, okay, yeah, that's probably going to affect tadpoles, but is, is that realistic? Is that actually how we're applying these products? Is that the concentration that we're applying them? Is that how we're putting them into stems? So, you know, there's there's a whole other thing you have to look at, and that's the risk of exposure. And so for following label precautions and label guidelines and label rates, uh, you know, the risk of exposure is, is vastly different uh, than what some of these studies are actually being performed at. Uh, the other part of that is that we we need to look at the label, and the label is the legal document, and until the label is changed by the Environmental Protection Agency, that's what we have to go by. Until the research designates that the label be changed in some way, shape, or fashion to uh, reference those studies, then until I see that, I, I'm going to go by what the label says. I, I think that, that second point is particularly noteworthy. You know, the EPA has toxicologists that review research uh, and, and make sure that the products that, that are being put out are, are going to be um, safe. And certainly they, you know, there's the opportunity that they may change an opinion at some point in their review process. but. Uh, we should. I, I'm inclined to wait for the EPA to to do a, a, a an analysis through their toxicologists. So, yeah, and I think this talk lends itself to these kinds of application methods too. So when you're very target specific, and where you're putting the products and the concentrations that you're putting the products, it's it's vastly different. Okay, um, Robert asks. You, you make uh, reference to percentages, you know, like. 50% this and 60% that. Are those percentages of the product? Or yes. so that's <laughs> the percentage of the product. It's not, it's not the percentage of the active ingredient. Yes. So these okay. studies, you're, this that's out of the jug. So you buy you know the Accord concentrate jug and I say 50%. It's not 50% active ingredients. It's 50% of the product, Accord concentrate or Polaris AC or whatever it was we were mentioning. Okay. And then I offer a um, a link. And so Dave mentioned several of these, many of several products and labels. New York has more rigorous labeling standards than many other states. Um, and so it's it's important that for those people who are in New York that you review the New York guidelines. And I posted that. It's called the PIMS site, and you can see that. You can see that link in the ch in the chat box. Most of what you mentioned were actually restricted use in New York. So I think, I, you know, I, I know Accord and and Rodeo are both restricted. Garlon Four is restricted. Element Four is restricted. So I think those you need to check those out. Uh, Melanie wants to know about the Lance injectors and if those are as effective as Hack and Squirt. So. Yeah, that's a good question. So there's a couple of, of the lance injector like I have in my herbicide publication. Um, it looks like a lance, but it really isn't a lance. Basically, it uses empty 22 shell casings that are filled with herbicide. And basically what the lance does, it actually takes that little shell casing and shoves it through the bark. And so the herbicide leaches around the edges of that 22 shell casing into the stem of the tree. 
I don't think they're very effective. I don't think they make a large enough cut to allow the herbicide to even get around that little shell casing. But I don't have a lot of experience with it. I've seen it operated. Um, I've photographed the guy that's, that's used it. But uh, other than that, so the other thing would be using a hypo hatchet, which is an injector. So you whack the tree with a hatchet that has little ports in the blade. There's a plunger mechanism built in and it squirts a, a designated amount of herbicide into each cut as you hit it so you don't have to have the spray bottle in your other hand spraying into those cuts. A couple hundred dollars for just that piece of equipment. I personally don't think it's worth it. I think you can do all of this work with a hatchet in a spray bottle or a hatchet in a backpack sprayer, you know, so I, I wouldn't advise purchasing any of those things. I, I don't think the cost is necessary. All right. Um, and then there's kind of a series of questions about the potential to use something like Garlon 4 or Element 4 on, I believe it was beech, if you if you treated just a branch, so essentially a, a basal bark treatment, but applied just to a branch, if that would kill the branch, but would but would not translocate into the stem, that would, would that just essentially, so if you want to do, do a to do a, like a using a garland for triclopyr as a pruning agent rather than just to kill the entire tree. Yeah, you you couldn't do that. There's a very good chance that you would hurt that tree pretty severely, if not completely kill it. Actually, so you need to use a, a side trimming type of herbicide. Um, I'm trying to look for that on here. There's a there's a product called Crenite S which the active ingredient is thosamine, and that actually is a trimming, side trimming type of herbicide where it will just take the branch out that you spray. So there are products like that, but Garland 4 is not one of them. All right. Harley wants to know, uh, has some red spruce and wants to release red spruce from beech, birch, and hay-scented fern. Any recommendations? <laughs> Well, I guess we probably need to know a little bit more, Pete, in the sense of what, what those sizes are. But probably that's going to be two different applications. And I mean, it could potentially be a broadcast application, mm -hmm. late, late season, once the spruce has set its final resting bud. Uh, if the birch and the beech are small enough that you could get coverage with a machine, you could drive through there and leave. You could selectively leave the, the red spruce. Late growing season, once the spruce is set, it's resting, but it's not susceptible to treatments, uh, foliar treatments of glyphosate. And so if she went back through and treated the fern, uh, she could be careful even around those and try not to get herbicide on it. But even if a little bit did get on it, um, it's not going to kill the spruce. Very low concentrations, maybe like a 1% solution even is all she would need, but then she'd have to go back and treat the birch and the beech with a hack and squirt or a cut stump or something like that afterwards. Okay. okay. Um, so, right, and, and uh, the, as Dave mentions, the, the size of these plants matters a lot. So if they're, you know, recently planted spruce seedlings versus um, large seedlings or small poles that are competing with beech and birch, if, if they're small poles, you know, two inch, three inch, four inch spruce, those, then the fern is probably not going to be much of an issue. Yeah, that's a good point. So, all right. Uh, Joanne wants to know if there are any dyes that you recommend to keep track of where you've sprayed. So, when you're doing um, either base, so if you're doing basal bark or cut stump, if you're doing cut stump two or three days later, how do you keep track of where you were three days prior or foliar sprays? Any, any comments about dyes? Yeah, so it's important to understand with dyes that, that when you're using them in a basal bark application, you need a dye that will go into oil versus a foliar or a stump treatment where you're using a product in water. Then you need to make sure that the dye is going to go in water. And so you need to just look at the product before you purchase it. I don't recommend one over the other. I use a product called Blazon, which goes into water. Um, a lot of the oils that you buy that are commercially available, they'll already put dye in it for you. But I absolutely recommend using dye for 
all of your treatments, whether they're foliar or whether they're stump treatment or basal bark, because it does really, really help you see where the herbicide is going. It'll also see if you've got any on you. <laughs> and you will be amazed how much blue dye you will get on you. <laughs> you look like a smurf at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, so it really shows you where this stuff is ending up. But it's great for foliar treatments because you can see those droplets on the leaves and really tell whether you've got coverage or not. You can come back on basal bark or stump treatments and see which ones you've treated. And so dye is very, very helpful. I recommend using it for all your treatments. What was the name of the dye that you use? Because I've had bad luck with dyes. I it use a dye called Blazon. In fact, I was just using it yesterday, and it it is great for foliar applications. You know, and it goes in water, and so I use it for all my foliar stuff, particularly like spring invasive shrubs. Put that in there, and it works really well to see those droplets, to see whether you've got coverage on that. Uh, it does really well. All right. Good, good. Uh, Robert wants to know about a mask, uh, to a respirator mask, um, whether you should have one, under what circumstances you should have one, and then um, is there a particular kind in, uh, to protect you against inhalation of herbicides? You know, in looking at the personal protective equipment of all the products that I've looked at, there's not one that, that requires you to wear a mask. So I've, I've never been concerned about that. We're not using, in these applications, we're not using a mist blower. Uh, if Possibly if you were out there and you're really spraying fine mist, uh, you might want to consider something like that. But um, none of these products that we've spoken about actually require you to wear one. So I do, I have a, a backpack mist blower that I sometimes use with glyphosate products. And that does because you're you're um, making it into a mist. The, the label does say to avoid inhalation of mist, or uh, there's another word I'm not coming to mind. So I have a, a mask that has I forget what the it's a it's a 3M product. So it's it's more than just like a mask that you would use a paper mask that you'd use when you're painting your house. It's an actual. And as a canister that that um, filters the air, so it, it's worth looking into to make sure you get adequate protection because you don't want to breathe those and under those application types methods. You don't want to get that into your lungs. Yeah. So, for example, I have the the Rodeo, which is 53.8 percent glyphosate label here in front of me. It it does say to avoid breathing spray mist, but looking at the personal protective equipment that's listed. The only things that are listed are long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes and socks. And so certainly under those kinds of application methods where you have a chance of breathing in fine mist, it probably would be recommended to wear one. But it, again, I don't see it on the label. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Steve posts a link to another place to get the, the, the uh, harness, the shoulder harness. So thank you for that, Steve. Um, and I've posted a link to the Ning site where I'll put some information. Uh, Tim wants to know if there's a link to the PDF, and I'm not sure, Tim, which PDF you're talking about. So hopefully you can, you can you're still on, and, and you can, you can put that further down in. Dave offers a link to applicators. Uh, Steve wants to know if he can download the slides. So yes, for those people that came in maybe a min minute or two late, if you go to the file menu in the top left corner and select save or save as the document, save it as a PDF, and then you can have a copy of, of Dave's presentation on your computer. Okay. Um, all right, Steve says there's a good price through the through his link for this shoulder safer harness. Ron says, um, "Black locust mentioned in comments, four to twelve. So, what what product is going to kill uh, black locust in the four to twelve inch diameter range?" So, I have not specifically treated black locust except when I worked in Virginia for releasing pines, and we found that. 
black locust was very susceptible to glyphosate. So I would assume the same holds true. Pete, I don't know if you have specific experience, but I would say in that case, a hack and squirt treatment using a 50% glyphosate would probably work very, very well mid to late summer, and it would control the root systems, leaving spaced cuts. Okay. I have not worked with uh, glyphosate that large, or with, with black locusts that large. Um, yeah. I, I inadvertently sprayed <laughs> sprayed some smaller black locust seedlings that I was trying to save, um, and you're right, they, they don't like glyphosate. <laughs> Yeah, legumes in general are very susceptible to glyphosate, so black locust is a legume and, and it'll be taken out. Um, all right. Uh, so Rick points out that one of the issues with exposure is not just the active ingredient, but also the surfactants and the um, adjuvants that are added and um, that those are not typically regula regulated by EPA. But the, the products um, are, are evaluated, um, so that I'd have to look into that more. But no, you're right. So when you look at the MSDS sheet, you're not looking at an MSDS for glyphosate. You're looking at it for whatever the product is that you're using. And so you can read about it and, and look at the toxicity values and all of those kinds of things. And based on your risk, of exposure to it. So are you wearing gloves? Are you getting it, you know, on you where you're breathing in the mist? So, you know, that's where you need to minimize that. What are you wearing when you're pouring the concentrate out of the jug? Uh, is there a risk of it splashing into your eye and so you're not wearing goggles or, or safety glasses? So, you know, you evaluate your risk of exposure as well. Uh, and Rick says if you're smelling it, you're breathing it, and so he uses a respirator rated for chemicals. So sometimes what you're smelling might not be the active ingredient. You're smelling something, I agree, and then you're certainly, if you're smelling that you're breathing it, but what you're smelling may not be the, the, the active ingredient or it may be some other, some other component of that product. So I guess if in doubt, um, it's good to use a respirator. So if there's any question about what's going on or if you have any reactions, um, you know, try a little bit and if there's any, any troubles. But uh, and, and Dave Dave points out looking at the label, the label's a critical piece of, of being safe and the labels will list the personal protective equipment, it'll list the minimum personal protective equipment. You can always use more personal yeah, protective great equipment. Point. Yep. So all right. Um, Lou Ward points out that black locust may re-sprout um, and, and the sprouts can come up a long distance from the stump. So doing something to control those roots, root systems is helpful. All right, we're gonna, we've been on now for 90 minutes. Dave, thank you very much. I'm gonna call this noon hour session to a close. I'll turn off the recording. And uh, Dave will be back for a 7 p.m. session. So, uh,